Hello there, I'm Mount Payne 27, and this is Dean of Doom, the show where we give grades to classic and contemporary Doom wants. Why? Because ranking things is fun. Today's episode will be dedicated to Nova 3, a boom compatible megawad released in 2020 by a team of entry level mappers led by an up and coming slaughter aficionado named Scotty. Nova 3 was made without its series founder Killdeath or its unofficial MVP Dobu Gabu Maru and endured a long and somewhat troubled development cycle. Over a four year period, project leadership bounced from Ann Mutt to 8079 to Scotty, who finally got it id games ready. Nova 3 is more structured than The Birth or New Dawn, divided into Hell, Jungle, and Moon episodes, and it's probably the hardest megawatt in the series pound for pound. With Scotty at the helm, that comes as no surprise. Its lengthy gestation period is partly responsible for this, but Nova 3 also has the series' most experienced lineup of mappers. By 2020, Paul977 had been shortlisted for a CAC award, Sin City 2100 and Antares 031 already had full megawatts under their belts, Benjogami, Bemused, and Naka Kurashiki were household names in various circles, and Killer5, yes, that Killer5, had already released Dimensions. The Nova series will always have a special place in my heart, but Nova 3 was my first, so it's been the hardest one to Dean of Doomify. It has an otherworldly spirit that will appeal to TNT fanatics, and vaulting ambition that will also appeal to TNT fanatics. I've been wanting to cover this megawatt for three years, so let's get this show on the road. Every map gets one grade for quality and one for difficulty. Quality grades go from A to F. Grade A levels are fun, memorable, visually distinctive, creative, and a fair challenge. We grade difficulty from X to E. X for extreme, E for easy, A through D in between. Keep in mind, my idea of a great map is probably not the same as yours, but that's okay. Disagreeing is part of the fun, after all. At the end of the day, this show is about spreading the the joy of doom. So let's do so. Before we start, the rules are we play on ultra violence and must pistol start each level. I need to play the wad twice before reviewing it. Saves are allowed, and we go for 100% kills in all levels, making exceptions when it's just not worth it. I play on Z Doom, and today's compatibility is boom. Now to the wad. Map 1, Port Murder. Since both wads start in Hell, it seems appropriate that Nova 3's opener would borrow a midi from Resurgence, but don't think you're in for Joshy tier abuse. A skybox change could set this map anywhere, but A2 Rob came out of the womb drawing interesting encounters in Doom Builder. Don't ignore the chainsaw at the start. It's useful if you're low on shells in the gore sewer. The Revenant's early debut portends Nova 3's comparatively high skill expectations, so get those fingers limber. Grade B, difficulty D+. Map 2, Death Crypt, as opposed to Life Crypt? This musty hell barracks is flush with foes. If your source port counts lost souls and the pain elemental gets busy, the kill count can top 200. Unsurprisingly, this is... tactical... Stiffy's first mapping credit. Death Crypt's dour brickwork interiors aren't much fun to look at, but the action's alright. Unlocking the super shotgun with this tiny red button shortens some of the weaker fights, including this stilted crusher hallway. The pentagram shootout is popcorn, but a badly timed teleport ambush lets you ruin the chain gun reveal by backtracking to take one off a dead commando. All in all, not bad for a newbie effort. Grade C, difficulty D+. Map 3, Dante Allegory. Everything in this map is off kilter, and that's why it interests me. Need Health's zany shapes and texturing invite comparisons to Kill Death's Nova 1 submissions, but thankfully Need Health has a bit more know how in the combat department. You might be tempted to chip away at this Revenant guard tower, but save yourself the aggravation. Hit this switch out in the lava and take the teleporter by the green torch to the red key. Then you can use the nearby console to grind them to powder. The final sequence of lackadaisically teleporting bad guys fits right in with the rest of Need Health's quizzical choices. Some of you might engage less with Dante's disheveled presentation, but when you play as much Doom as I do, sparks of originality become more precious than whole maps of clean execution. Grade B, difficulty C-. Map 4, Calm the Fire. I love Nova 3, but even in the best relationships, there are going to be things about each other that you can't stand. Calm the Fire's deconstructionist approach turns my stomach. You get 35 health points and minimal supplies to handle an obnoxious pain elemental, three revenants, a chain gunner, a mancubus, and an asshole archvile. There's no room for creative use of resources in this symmetrical Tupperware container, no damage control, no berserk, and virtually no routing flexibility either. Some will pat themselves on the back for labeling Calm the Fire a combat puzzle, but its stinginess and rigidity do not make it clever 
just annoying. Grade D minus, difficulty B minus. Map five, Blood Eagle. Only slightly less gruesome than the Viking execution it's named for, Blood Eagle will strip the flesh from players unprepared for its savagery. Barfed into the map by a toothy sector monster, you'll have to relapse on roids to survive in this ammo desert. Scotty tempers his resource stringency with a ton of room to move, ample opportunities for infighting, and some helpful secrets for observant players. This double baron crusher room will heave your heart into your mouth, the pain elementals make mounds of mischief, and the free-for-all finale lets you kick ass without worrying too much about your own. Scotty's visual chops are bloody outstanding. His tortured, half-digested Hellcastle barely contains the Whales of the Damned. It took a while for me to warm to it, but Blood Eagle has become one of my favorite maps in Nova 3 Hell. Grade A, difficulty B. Map 6, Fury Begins. A lot of great maps have used this Jazz Jackrabbit MIDI, but I think this is my favorite one. A2 Rob's combat sizzles from start to finish. The opening Rocket Rodeo, the bloody pit fight, ripped from Valiant Map 11, and the final BFG Ballyhoo are the best of a great lot. It's neat to replay A2 Rob's older maps now that I know his style has outgrown Skillsaw devoteeism, but Fury Begins' derivative elements don't dull its adrenal amperage at all. Bad artists copy, good artists steal. Maybe it benefits from the last two maps enforcing restraint, but cutting loose in Fury Begins is so rejuvenating. Grade A-, minus, difficulty B+. Footnote, finding this shootable scrolling wall secret might be the most I've worked for 100 points of health. Map 7, Cannibal. This is the moment I knew Nova 3 was going to be a Dean of Doom episode. Cannibal doesn't look like rookie work at all. Its sumptuous lighting, texturing, and decoration, suave item placement, satisfying fights, simmering atmosphere, and dramatic flair launched Paul977 to the top of my mappers to watch list. If you only knew him from this map, you might say Paul is Darkwave's heir apparent. He gives you tons of running room, but never lets you stand still, and his stylized traps look menacing as hell, but fold under aggressive play most of the time. If you get the BFG before facing the Mastermind Pincer, you can scatter the chaff, telefrag the Brainiacs, and hold your fire. As if the radical volume change didn't pull the rug out from under you hard enough, check this out. I adore this fight. The double-decker surprise thrills me even when I know it's coming. Cannibal's last fight is its most Speed of Doom-esque. Skate around the Kakos and Hell Knights to unleash an infighting milk cow and the battle is won. I won't deny that Paul's influences score him trays of brownie points, but Cannibal's quiet confidence and raw fun factor would win over anybody. Grade A, difficulty B+. Map 8, The Crow Comes Last. Angry Saint sure likes this MIDI. The Crow Comes Last is full of sniping enemies with long sight lines, spring-loaded ambushes that are either cruel or irrelevant, and many needless barons. I applaud his extensive use of curves and bevels, but I will never understand how Angry Saint thought this 2D bramble maze looked acceptable. In the Crow's first half, you can safely retreat from every encounter, but then stuff starts teleporting behind you. In the case of the Red Key ambush, stuff equals two cages worth of impotent chain gun fodder, which I guess I prefer to a time-wasting fight that's also dangerous. Speaking of which, when you finally kill the Baron from the beginning, eight chain gunners pop up around you, which is the only part of this map cheaper than its ending. Yuck. Grade D, difficulty B+. Map 9, Scarlet Syzygy. There are way too many X's, Y's, and Z's congregating on my screen right now. A less malnourished version of Map 4, Scarlet Syzygy, cuts its monster count to the quick, but it's prettier and more mentally stimulating than Calm the Fire, a snack for speedrunners. The ammo balance makes playing Pedal to the Metal more precarious without consuming too much time if you mess up. Nova 3's two micro hell maps seem like they belong to a different project. I think they could have been replaced with more substantive entries at no cost of the episode. Grade C+, difficulty C. Map 10, a partner of the 49th day. It is my limited understanding that in Buddhist traditions, the soul is said to remain on Earth for seven weeks following death. On the 49th day, a trial is conducted to determine where the soul will go. Reincarnation, heaven, or hell. Suffused with such mortal significance and wound tight as a drum by Primeval's MIDI, a partner of the 49th day is revelatory work, easily the most arresting visual experience in the episode, and some would say the entire megawatt. No mapper gets more out of the color red than Nanka Kurashiki. 
It saturates your eyes, blazing from alien marble and torches and lava. It drips out of strung up corpses and ductwork guts. The sheer physicality of her architecture calls Deus Vault to mind, but Kurashiki kindly refrains from Hoi Fam caliber grandiosity in the combat department. You'll get the rocket launcher before you step inside the building and will lean on it often. The big ticket fights are loud, but not too tricky until the final stretch. Reading from the scroll of human flesh kicks off the church showdown, and it scares the crap out of me. With a cyber deacon watching over all, and two archviles waiting in the wings, maneuvering through the pews and around the clambering hemorrhage of teleporting demons can be dicey. The final fight gift wraps an invulnerability for you, but after having my head repeatedly slammed in Hell's exit door jam by this cyber demon and his backing band, I have to encourage holding on to it. Take a deep breath before plunging into the flood of cacos, revenants, and hell nobles, and try not to burn all your cells. The rapturous aesthetics, plentiful unwritten lore, and cinematic epilogue make a partner of the 49th day one of Nova 3's standout maps. Grade A, difficulty A-. Footnote, find three switches that look like this, and you're in for one hell of a do you like caco. Map 11, Terramin. Alternatively titled Terraforming Minds in the intermission screen, Terramin opens the new episode with a cyber demon roar and a feast for the eyes. Pink Acid seems thrilled to be working in Boom. Terramin is rife with tripwires and tiny details, including doom cute tools, industrial equipment, and palm trees. He even throws in a few literal conveyor belts for good measure. My favorite moment in the map is this berserk secret, which showcases a grinder that actually hurts if you pass through it on the wrong tick. Pink Acid's combat chops aren't quite as inspired Inspired, though he does have a knack for surprise encounters. Most of these fights give you too much space or not enough. The mineshaft crawl will have you tugging at your shirt collar, but this outdoor area is so big it's almost unfair to the monsters. The cyber showdown might get hairy if infighting goes sideways, and the archvile triple team is a searing coda. Terraman's gifted decoration scores big, but its simplistic structure and neutral action reveal Pink Acid's inexperience. About time we saw something resembling newbie work in this newbie megawatt. Grade B+. Plus. Difficulty, B-. Map 12, Beautiful Agony. In typical Sin City style, Beautiful Agony hits hard out of the box, and the punches don't stop until the Macubus sings. With all these hit scanners and revenants around, hasty play will kill you quick, or look pretty cool if you're actually good at Doom. Beautiful Agony's excessive symmetry is worth critiquing. Clear out any staircase or corridor, and you can be almost sure that there's another one just like it on the opposite side. This makes a lot of fights redundant, and peekaboo shooting is already the best strategy for many of these encounters. The double arch file attack in the Sanctum is a good scare, and the Cyber Demon Revenant finale is tense enough to win me over, but I consider this one of Sin City's lesser efforts overall. Grade C+, difficulty B. Map 13, Tomb of Solitude. After a decade-long Doom Community hiatus, Bad Bob from Community Chest rebranded as DT and submitted maps to several community projects in tandem with Nova 3. Tomb of Solitude queues up an old reliable Lands of Lore midi for some instant atmosphere, and the shadow-drenched fiery temple aesthetic evokes Epic 2. DT saves the fireworks for his final fight, but the buildup is suspenseful and occasionally nasty. The Red Skull Key Trap pins you between Hell Knights and platforming while putting you in the sights of a Macubus and Kako, and this pitfall will make your hardware feel inadequate, so you might as well roll up your sleeves. The Secret BFG will only slightly dampen the explosive Yellow Key fight. Three Cyber Demons, three Goon Spewing Teleporters, and three Surprise Archviles is one heck of a trifecta. I've always liked this map's economical monster placement, snazzy visuals, and sense of forgottenness, but I am a tiny bit nostalgia blind on account of the MIDI. Grade A minus, difficulty B plus. Map 14, El Dorado. Albertoni's two contributions to this megawad are Nova to the bone, clunky, but unburdened by conventional thinking. El Dorado is pure surrealism. In El Dorado, the rivers run gold, mid-texture grass grows thick, and parallel dimensions shake hands. This Mary Poppins building is one of the strangest silent teleports I've taken, ditto with this tunnel that leads to the Yellow Key, which levitates on a cargo ship. Most of Albertoni's ambushes can be fled without a scratch, and he's generous with rockets and cells, but it's worth opening this misaligned wall, taking another slipgate, and digging up buried treasure to cushion the final fight. Even with a BFG, things can take a turn for the worst, especially after Cybe shows up. This makes four straight Cyberdemon boss battles in the jungle episode. I'm fond of El Dorado, peccadillos and all. 
Grade B, difficulty B. Map 15, Megiddo 3. I played Nova 3 first because I'm weird, so I wasn't taken aback by Megiddo 3's middle act appearance. I was wondering what happened to the first two. Three years later, I regard this as the least essential Megiddo, and as the black sheep of the trilogy solely for being shorter than at least two other maps in its megawad. Like usual, Megiddo the third employs a hub structure, with portals leading to miniature maps by different authors. Before you do anything else, drop into the water, hit this switch, and shoot the sadder face on this column. This opens the entrance to the secret maps, which are too good to pass up. Each domain contains a key card and a skull key. You'll need all six to get to map 31. Let's start with Paul's portal. Small but fierce, Paul 977's corner of Megiddo tests your space management skills. You get a full view of the first fight before it starts, so formulate an answer for this pincer attack before initiating it. The zombie and pain elemental room is more amusing than dangerous, and with that taken care of, you can grab the skull and make a break for it. I always have more trouble with this all-round assault than I expect to, but but then again, the absent-minded professor also forgot he had a BFG for the first five minutes of this playthrough. Note that Paul's section can be muzzled if you bring in ammo from A2 Rob's section. The most violent and substantive chunk of Megiddo 3 is an unfolding firefight in an ancient city block. With its heaps of foes and bigger heaps of ammunition, it feels like the successor to Cannonball's piece of Megiddo 1 mixed with a bit of bingo pool hall of blood from back to Saturn X E1. The latter rounds sprinkle archviles, cyberdemons, and a clumsy mastermind into the throngs of imps, revenants, arachnos, and cacos. Always keep cells handy for situations like these. Even a blur sphere can't protect you from this downpour of lead. Rob's secret key is the hardest of the three to find. A hidden switch in the Cyberdemon Chapel opens the crag it's sitting on. Pegleg's section is the least noteworthy of the three. Most of its action is confined to two circle strafable arenas that fill with teleporting monsters, fish in a barrel. This monster display case fight is kind of interesting to look at, and the pop-up ambush in the keycard room may spook the unwary, but nothing in this section section can stand up to the BFG. Plain and simple. The same cannot be said for the final slam dance, which comes courtesy of project leader and hub architect Scotty. The pandemonium that this many pain elementals can wreak, especially when you're distracted by archviles and a cavalcade of spiders, is a thing of beauty. But I have to say, I don't really appreciate... Yeah. Stay far away from the Archvile commune during the last wave, or they'll redefine the term air frying with your carcass. When Scotty's last stand is history, return to the secret nook and polish off one last cyber to punch your ticket out of here. Megiddo 3 is comparatively concise, and I like how it ties the secret exit hunt into its portal hopping premise, but the map 15 slot does limit how grand and oppressive it's allowed to be, which weakens the Megiddo brand somewhat. Grade B+, difficulty A. Map 31, Solar Powered. A sublime symbiote of gimmick and setting, Solar Powered is a singular creation sprung from the beautiful mind of Big Ol' Billy. I suspect this began life in the jungle episode, and graduated to secret map status after Billy baked his concept into these augmented Aztec ruins. If you want to reach the exit volcano, the booming skybox sun must shine on five solar panels scattered across the grounds. The ensuing search and find is driven as much by environmental storytelling as demon killing. It's fun to wonder whether these supply crates belong to some thwarted expedition, who put these poor imps in cages, and most importantly, how technology became so entwined with antiquity. Stone pressure plates operate hydraulic elevators, severed heads are stacked next to floodlights, and power meters all around the map keep track of your progress. Solar powered starts mild-mannered, but its hardest fights will burn you with a magnifying glass. If the plasma rifle reprisal and this death-defying bridge battle made you hold your breath, wait till you see the true ending. To reach these hidden ruins, find the eye switch poking out of this painting, or or make a crazy jump from the bridge to the perimeter wall. You don't have to be a symbologist to crack this code. You can lower these grinning faces and come up with some kind of mnemonic, or just brute force it and save scum like I did the first three times. Solar Powered's true final fight is a scorcher. Two cyber demons and four oscillating medicine men protect the BFG, lowering it triggers a powwow of mancubi and lost souls, and opening the secret exit springs one last wave of revenants. This searing epilogue is punishment for wimping out of your volcano sacrifice, and makes you feel like you're trespassing on sacred ground. Solar Powered is one of the finest secret maps ever made. Let us all face east and bow to big ol' Billy. Grade A+, difficulty A-. Some maps are meant to be discovered on your own. No review or gameplay footage can substitute for an authentic first impression, and the next map deserves your first impression. This is one of Dean of Doom's biggest flaws. I have to risk spoiling something special for you in order to talk about it. If you do decide to stick around, the least I can do is share my story of Map 32 with you. Map 32, 
Fire Blue Palace. It's almost midnight on December 25th, 2020. A freezing wind is blowing outside and solar power just sunburned me badly. Even though it's time to go to bed, I think, let's open the next map just to see what it is. The opening notes of funky stars come plinking through my speakers like digital raindrops, several cyber demons sound off, and Z-Doom promptly takes a nosedive into single digit frames per second. I have such a vivid memory of my first time playing this map, not just because it's conjoined with late night winter bliss, I've also never experienced such a jumble of sensations playing a Doom map. How could I not laugh at the fire blue, the BFG spam, the number 69 and the kill count, and my own ineptitude at killing cyber demons? How could I not love the shameless gimmickry? How could I help but feel a little frustrated that this map was beyond my ability to coast through, especially with its hideous performance? How could I resist the allure of such a dreamy netherworld? I fell in love with Fire Blue Palace in the first. Silliness, memory, frustration, and all. For me, it epitomizes the power of the Doom Engine to capture glimpses of worlds beyond our comprehension. It is December 25th, 2020, and tomorrow I'm releasing a video essay on the Mucus Flow, a map which I think is probably going to be one of the last ones to wow me. A minute ago, I was thinking I've seen pretty much everything there is to see in Doom, but I've just finished Fire Blue Palace, and I've never been so happy to be wrong. Grade A+, plus. difficulty A. Map 16, Dregs of a Bitter Cup. Nova 3's map ordering is impeccable. Whether you just made it out of Megiddo 3 or survived the head trip of Fire Blue Palace, Dregs of a Bitter Cup provides a stopgap of deathly quiet. I'm normally ambivalent about non-midi music in Doom, but Obake's selection suffuses his crypt with fear and dread. Not many maps make routine encounters this unsettling. Dregs has few fights worth discussing, but gunplay is obviously not the focus here. This is one of Nova 3's most memorable maps on apprehension alone. Blood is flowing out of the walls, for Christ's sake. The yellow skull key reveals a huge, mostly empty cavern where you'll eventually stumble into a deep chasm with a teleporter that spirits you to the exit. Some may shrug at the anticlimactic ending, but I think its lack of punctuation is an essential ingredient for Obake's brand of horror. This is an easy map to finish, but a hard one to shake. Grade A-, difficulty C-. Map 17, Kamir Agul Tan. Kamir Agul Tan produces just 10 results on Google, and most of them point to this map, so either I have an American search engine issue, or those words are made up. We've strayed from the jungle to the desert, which is fitting, because Kamir Agul Tan is a realm of extremes. The hitscanner riddled opening ambush, archvile red carpet, and cyberdemon temple tantrum hit significantly harder than the rest of the map. But then again, there's a megasphere and BFG secret that's available whenever. I just always forget about it. Where Knight doesn't believe in navigational handholding. This satyr raises a bridge to two switches which need keys you don't have yet, but also quietly opens the yellow key corridor. Hmm. This archfile closet switch seems important. A few minutes later, you'll discover that it opened a teleporter tucked in this hallway, which takes you to the red key, which operates a switch that opens the exit door, because why not add one more step? This is a Nova map, all right. Grade C, difficulty B. Map 18, Napkin Math. Possibly the most polarizing map in the Megawad, Napkin Math hits first timers like a stiletto in the lung. Four secrets, they gasp. Where? This bloody coffin uses the bare minimum textures and square footage, but proportionally bursts with side quests. The Easter egg hunt is fun, but the prizes you get from it are a mirage. Napkin math is lawful evil. Fair, but not trustworthy. Nothing matters in this map except the final fight, and nothing in the final fight matters except health and shotgun shells. Go ahead and balk at my using rockets on these imps, but it's not like I can turn them on the revenants and pain elementals. Splash yourself and you're dead. Fall off the edge and you're dead. Catch the vile's evil eye and you're dead. Run out of shells and you're dead. Oh, have I mentioned you get one medikit going into this fight and nothing else? I've taken a lot of abuse from this map, but ultimately I've come to love its lack of compromise. Grade A-, difficulty A-. Map 19, Ancestral Domain. Stillness. That's Paul 977's secret weapon. In a world where rocket launcher free-for-alls are a dime a dozen, Paul's maps still loom large because he's comfortable with silence. The quavering drone of Sam Woodman's MIDI anchors Ancestral Domain. It doesn't seem to care if it has your attention, and that's what makes it so unnerving. Though aesthetically closer to a long-forgotten Speed of Doom map, Ancestral Domain is more Death Destiny's descendant than Dark Waves this time. Paul uses turrets and short-fused teleports in a way that reminds me of both Disturbia and 
and Elysion. The final fight is built on turrets almost exclusively. Decimate the Mancubi before tending to the Boneheads, but ignore the Spider Sentry and all these noble sacrifices. Ancestral Domain is one of Nova 3's keystone maps. Its commanding dynamics mirror this megawad's graceful fluctuations of tone and intensity. Contrast is everything. Grade A, difficulty B. Map 20, Ritual Horror. The perfect fusion of Nova 3's jungle motifs, Ritual Horror commingles perilous action with unspeakable mystery. Also a fitting description of this immortal Mark Clem midi. Scotty's episode finale is intense and intensely obscure. It took me four playthroughs to fully appreciate because goddamn are some of these secrets secret. Kingly treasures and cathartic blasting await perceptive, keen-eyed, and lucky players, but it might take a Doom Wiki detour to fully conquer this beast. Though restrained by Scotty's standards, Ritual Horror's combat can elegantly trounce the uncareful, and uses monsters not just as game pieces, but also mood pieces. For example, Patience is the right play in the Bloody Plutonia convention, but the Chain Gunner Flood is so intimidating that I reflexively want to respond with aggression. The final fight gears us up for something eviler than what actually arrives, but the threat in that forbidden vial, and the eerie silence in the poison-scarred basin after it's all said and done, that's what this map is about. Scotty completes his ritual with one of the most memorable Doom transitions around. <laughs> This moment alone makes him worthy of his Nova stewardship. I do struggle with this map. It's hard to learn and fairly demanding, but it somehow always manages to transmute my frustration into fascination. Grade A, difficulty A. Map 21, Platform Base. The evolution lover in me wants to enjoy Platform Base. It strenuously simulates a real place. The auto map even tells you which floor you're on. In pursuit of three keys, you'll bounce between the pitch dark exterior, monster window dressed to the nines, and the interior, cramped and slow, but full of widgetry. The control room lets you toggle various doohickeys in the docking bay while demons invade, and the doom cute domiciles and office scenes recall TNT's lunar mining project and central processing. Combat is kind of an afterthought here, but the the Golden Falls fight fooled me once, and two cyber demons spearhead the color vomit rooftop fight. Platform Base ends up being one of Nova 3's most monotonous experiences, but it's also the only Doom map on Skeleton Patch's CV, so impressive dabbling. Grade C, difficulty C+. Map 22, Lunar Calm Station. DM Phobos pledges allegiance to Back to Saturn X. Lunar Calm Station is polished, interconnected, and balanced for breezy ballistics. The rocket launcher room looks threatening if you don't grab the plasma first, and the final fight's a tester. Press this switch, quash the Mancubus zigzag, and a hallway in the western section will sink, revealing the path of the egg. It. Don't be hasty. The supercharge and mega armor perched on this rock will muffle the last hurrah. Lunar Comm Station demonstrates control of tech base craft, but lacks a personality of its own. Grade B, difficulty B minus. Map 23, Lunatic Deus. I'm surprised Paul977 is only co credited here. His hallmark turret enemies, idle monsters, and pain elementals are recognizable from the outset, complemented once again by simmering MIDI atmosphere, on loan from TNT Revolution. I admire the high precision opener and this outdoor encounter but the ending's a bit easy if you didn't lose all of your secret soul sphere. The Hell Knights and Mastermind automatically distract each other and the more serious threats are stuck in place. As space horror, Lunatic Deus falters after the first minute or so, and all of its suspense, which depends on Ionian isolation anyway, is lost on replay. Grade B, difficulty B. Map 24, the ship that wore a mask. Albertoni packed a full megawads worth of Nova energy into two maps, shipwrecked at a deep space planar crossroads and set to King Crimson, the ship that wore a mask is about as weird as they make them. Hold on to your sanity as the edges of reality fray around you, or confusion will be your epitaph. Once again, Albertoni uses instant teleport lines to knit together abstract spaces, sometimes ad infinitum, and the contrast between his fine tooth lighting gradients and relatively vanilla rooms and corridors amplifies the tension in his environments. Interestingly, the secret blue keycard in the checkered tile realm that unlocks this soul sphere also allows you to bypass this blood and water room completely. There's no wimping out of the final fight, though. Holy moly, does Albertoni turn up the heat here. After a nearly coverless four-corner barrage of spiders and manks, a cyber demon and two archviles appear. Try keeping some mancubi alive to play with the goat while you put out the fire. The ship that wore a mask is the better of Albertoni's two wonderlands. His offbeat imagination is one of Nova 3's key ingredients. Grade A-, difficulty B+. Map 25, 
Alpha Scorpii Supercluster. Prepare to make the jump to light speed. Antares 031 has built his career on surgical geometry, sleek custom texture use, and symphonic combat, but Alpha Scorpii Supercluster might just be his most inspiring piece of work. Every time I play it, it leaves me speechless and breathless. 999 monsters strong, Alpha Scorpii measures its biggest fights in megatons, but every encounter, great and small, propels you forward. Antares' pickup distribution is the secret sauce. He's generous, but prefers stim packs to Kits and loose shells to boxes, which keep you hungry on the breadcrumb trail. To get the big power-ups, you need to be constantly pushing into the headwind of the storm, which only gets more torrential. I used the word inspiring to describe this map as much for Antares' jaw-dropping, FPS-buckling exterior shots as for Tristan Clark's Stardust. Many of Clark's middies dwell on the dark side of the moon, but this liftoff anthem sends our hearts soaring into the heavens. The blue key battle in the Golden Lunar City is where Alpha Scorpii reaches its screaming apogee. The early secret BFG tucked in this tower teleporter makes the fight easier, but at this point I think I prefer going in without it. It's just so crazy. With the blue key acquired, knock down the Cyber Demon and Bone Brigade standing between you and the dome, and cruise through the final fight on a bright green jet stream to lay this moon base to rest. Alpha Scorpii Supercluster astonishes with its nuclear action, intricate architecture, and super fluidity, distilling the greatness of Antares solo megawatt into 40 of the most exuberant minutes you will ever experience in Doom. It's unequivocally one of the greatest maps of all time. Grade A+, difficulty A-. Map 26, Armstrong. Another upbeat moon bounce to balance out the coming gloom, Armstrong is probably the most Valiant-like map in the episode. Its detailing standard is identical to Skill Saw's, radioactive moon mud saturates its grounds, arch files lead the feature fights, it's even got a pain elemental infested rocket silo. Armstrong absorbs me until I have to start finding keys. Rob subtly labels the switches that unlock them, but that's hard to notice in the opening hubbub, especially when the switches are placed so far away from the mechanisms they operate. I tend to rely on the vials Rob summons to point me in the right direction. This missable secret stashes a motherload of rockets and a megasphere. A full stack is helpful for this fight, if you don't know you can just run away from it. Armstrong is a tad derivative, but undeniably entertaining. Grade A-, difficulty B+. Map 27, Beta 3. Inarguably well-crafted, but also slightly taxing, Beta 3 is a sprawling science complex with artistic chops to spare. The early computer map and DT's conscientious color coding make navigation much less daunting, but Beta 3's fun factor wanes as its visual complexity waxes. The Red Key Wing, specifically, packages the map's richest and most memorable sights with its worst action. The plasma rifle platform is clearly constructed to be fled from, but I can't stand the smug looks on these bastards, dancing almost out of reach. I almost invoked it's just not worth it for this obnoxious encounter. The BFG is available too early and a bit overpowered. You can get it before the plasma rifle, and all but ammo spendthrifts will obliterate the last few fights with it. Waltz of the Demons is trite and too short for a map this size, but I suspect it's there to acknowledge Beta 3's genetic similarity to Suspended in Dusk. Players who savor more deliberate Doom campaigns will gobble this up. Grade B+. Plus. Difficulty, B+. Map 28, Mare Crisium. The marvelously creepy Mare Crisium is Benjo Gami's first map, and interesting to revisit now that I'm Benjo literate. Wandering monsters, restrained texturing, knee-knocking arch files, and trepidatious pacing were established toilet god tropes even back in 2020. Thankfully, the extreme difficulty he's also known for doesn't rear its head, until the end. Once you fight your way out of the dark tunnels, arm yourself, and blast through this catastrophic ambush, it's time to search the warehouse and sleeping quarters for a a pair of keys, a tense and often claustrophobic task. Ben Jogami is gracious to the active secret hunter, but even the well-prepared should expect an ass-whooping in the canyon. About 15 seconds after the initial bombardment starts, two archviles appear on the cliff, which is a big blow to your survival odds. That I remember Mare Crisium more for its sinister undercurrent than its nasty ending is a testament to Benjo the MIDI composer. Grade A-, minus, difficulty A. Map 29, Deep Space 9mm. A kitchen sink of ambitious visuals, heck 
galactic fights and harebrained secrets, Deep Space Nine Millimeter is the map I most regret disliking in Nova 3. Among other things, it's a cautionary tale about the importance of MIDI selection. This track is loud, hyperactive, and repetitive, and Deep Space Nine Millimeter is neither short enough for it nor the constant thrill ride it advertises. Sure, Deep Space has some explosive sequences, but it cares more about impressing the player with whiz bangs than keeping their momentum going. Five Secrets is plenty of incentive to take your time, but again, the clarity you'll need to uncover them is annihilated by this music. Two of the shootable switches are just heinous, and this non-secret backpack in Baron hurts my brain. There are four other backpacks in the map, so why would you even need to... <sighs> whatever. Obtaining the blue keycard unleashes archfile flights by the lab and the rocket silo, and this secret jump gate shortcut can bafflingly make your life harder. Taking it warps you right to the BFG, where a hysterical firefight immediately breaks out. If you bypassed the pile of vials outside, then you just turned a hard fight into the megawad's worst. Amok doesn't give you a rocket launcher either, so every big encounter comes down to how many cells you have in your pack and jacks the volume up to 12. Deep Space 9mm looks like a million bucks, but it's protracted and and overstimulating. Grade C+, difficulty A. Map 30. Into the Unknown. Somewhere between the moon and the abyss, between Megiddo 4 and God Machine, dwells into the unknown. It's a subdued conclusion, more epilogue than ultimate challenge, but Nova 3's recurring fascination with dark enigmas demanded an answer. Full of quiet animus and powered by this hypnotic Christian Aro midi, Into the Unknown is definitely an answer. Tristan Clark designed the opening shot and entryway before donating his work to science in 2016. I suspect Paul977 made everything between the candle walk and the final arena. His quirks are pretty easy to spot, but Scotty seems responsible for the rest. They make a formidable team. Paul's raging legions and unchained archfile strikes make his earlier maps look soft, but you can never say he didn't warn you. Bullseye this shootable switch to open a secret telefrag for the cyber sniper, and with all three keys in hand, you can teleport back to the void lookout. This terrific light-up stair sequence sets the scene for an unconventional finale. The awe-inspiring Cacodemon Exodus from the Fire Black Gates is unfortunately upstaged by a less glamorous, more dangerous part two. After drinking another forbidden potion in the other place, the Skull Keys descend. Lack of armor makes this last-ditch backstab of archviles, pain elementals, and cyberdemons a little precarious, but it feels like inadequate punctuation for a megawatt ender. Nova 3 does have one of the most unsettling last shots in the biz. Take it from one who's done some serious scouring of the umbral planes, this is about as weird as it gets before you venture out to the fringes. I'll see you there. Grade A, difficulty A. So, I will always care deeply for Nova 3. It rekindled my love of Doom when I was in a dry spell, and emboldened me to try weirder, wilder wads, to pursue that fleeting glimpse of something in the shadows. Ironically, Nova 3 is probably the most conventional entry in the series. The unkempt Nova 1 gushes eccentric charm, and Nova 2, unbound by thematic constraints, also feels slightly more experimental. But Nova 3 has the most distinctive tone, and offers great flavor and artistry within the confines of its chosen aesthetics. I also happen to think it has the greatest pair of secret levels in the history of Doom mapping. I really, really hope somebody starts Nova forever someday. I would love to be a part of it. My final grade for Nova 3 is an A-. Difficulty-wise, I struggle with it a lot less today than I did in 2020, but Nova 3's longer outings take a toll, and I still think it's a cut above the modern standard on the whole, so B plus it is. Now for my Dean's list. Valedictorian is a tie between Map 31 and Map 32, Solar Powered, and Fire Blue Palace. Salutatorian, Map 22, Alpha Scorpii Supercluster, a Valedictorian in pretty much any other megawad. Class President, Map 29, Deep Space 9mm, and the dunce cap goes to Map 4, Calm the Fire. Nova 3 absolutely qualifies for an honor roll, so here we go. Map 5, Blood Eagle. Map 6, Fury Begins. Map 7, Cannibal. Map 10, A Partner of the 49th Day. Map 13, Tomb of Solitude. Map 16, Dregs of a Bitter Cup. Map 18, Napkin Math. Map 19, Ancestral Domain. Map 20, Ritual Horror. Map 24, The Ship That Wore a Mask. Map 26, Armstronged. Map 28, Mare Crisium. And Map 30, 
into the unknown. Thank you very much for watching, and please feel free to share your thoughts on the wad down below. I'd love to hear what you think, and I'll heart your comments to let you know I've read them. Now I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my generous patrons. Aaron Allen, Agile Jackson, Agu XYZ, Alephany, Alex Topfer, Artisan Talzar, Bo Higginbotham, Beatbeard, Ben Barrett, Birdburn, Blexor, Builder Sith, Bitefire, Kappa Bitch, Captain Wave, Cheese Wheel, Chloe584, Christophine Place, Cinnamon, Cutman Mike, Demo, Dan, Delirium, Doot Yourself, Dorothy Miller, Eggboy, Ellen Furno, Emma Essex, Francis T218, Galaquack, General Roasterock, Gothic Box, Griffin Upchurch, Hasamnas, Henners Lenners, Henning, Hexelix, Hot Tomato, Hyakcho, Idiot Supreme, In Captivity, Jeff Hibbert, Jimmy Paddock, Jose Ballestero, Josh Ballard, Jude, Just Some Schmuck, Just Great 98, Killplane, Quan, Large Cat, Lexi Max, Lumnal, Mancubian Candidate, Mark Rowland, Master Drew 117, Matthew Gower, McJimbles, Michael Akins, Miracle Water, Mixer, Moco Mothman MM47, Mosicon, Mr. Bob Cyndaquil, Myolden, Nafferty, Neurometry, Nick XCOM, Knights 108, Number 26, Not Obelisk, NX Avery, Omnibot, Painful Hill 72, Pengerzan, Pezaveng Jaj, Phantom Puff, Philip Coffee, Princess Entrapta, Pyro She, Quibs, Red Doom Nerth, Reese, Reese Anderson, Richard Fry, Roadworks, Rufy, Sean Grant, Sid Menon, Sir Lethbridge Doomer, Snacker Fork, Stone Mason, Stupid Nick, Sundry 66, Sunriser, Super Pecan Man, Sylvester Priss, Tara Cushino, The Fiery Charmeleon, The Freeman 500, The Lippy Server, The Sapphire Tri, TJG 1289, Trilby Trillion, Turbine 2K5, Video Game Lover, Wandering Autumn Leaves, Why Bemo Not a Crab, and William Huber. Thank you. I appreciate you all. This is Mount Payne 27, and I'll see you in the next episode of Dean of Doom.